Um, thank you, Mr. Abbas, and um, welcome you all. Uh, it's great to see such a crowd here today. Um, so since we had like 10 minutes before, now five, so I'll try to quickly um, make my points. Um, constructing a plural society in the shark region. Even the title assumes that um, we, we are some kind of, in some kind of homogenous arrangement within the shark community. However, our history, tradition, the past and present sociology like, shows us we couldn't have been more wrong. The region is going through another episode of its 200 years of troubled and almost schizophrenic societal experience. The ethnic nationalism of the 19th century, followed by emerging nation states, then all of them started to see minorities or the people who they see as different or doesn't fit into their uh, categorization as threats and potential traitors. And moving from there, we moved into, with the emergence of Israel, more into uh, religious nationalism, and then the Kurdish questions, uh, and finally emergence of violent extremism in the region. These all pushed into the thing like pushed us into this impossible mission to construct a homogenous society. However, what we need to do is we already live in diverse plural societies. What we need to learn is how we can live with them peacefully. In this speech, I want to quickly go through some of the obstacles on our path um, that, that stops us from living peacefully what we have been already born into. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of the concepts that we always know and try to problematize them and see how they become obstacles in our everyday lives. First, I wanna start with ideology. We are living in a post-ideological world. Some of the ideologies we hang on to in today are product of different sociological conditions. Let's take, for example, Islamism. Islamism has grew as a reaction to movements of early 20th century and late 19th century, modernity, communism, ethno-nationalism. So it was a product of its time. Although Islamism is still relevant today, being an ideology itself, we need to realize its limitations. I'm not saying that we should drop all ideologies for plural society, but we need to realize I, something being an ideology in itself means it has limits and it excludes some things that are existential. Again, walking through our Islamism as an example, Islamism only takes particular ideas, values, and uh, rituals of Islam and highlights those as a response to a particular social phenomena. So it's important to understand that as the sociological conditions change, we have to recalibrate, readjust our ideologies. And sometimes, in the case of some ideologies, we have to get rid of them. So as soon as one thinks ideologies are all encompassing, then it becomes, it pushes us towards rigidity and exclusion. So I'm not saying drop ideology, but realize that all ideologies, all isms are not wholesome, holistic, and also they have limitations. The second issue I want to problematize is identity. As ideology, identity is a social construct. There are, these are like ideology, identity, these are important tools to organize, to discern, to even rule and exercise power in our societies. However, what's important that, to realize that we create these constructs and they are not existential. So as the time and the sociologies change, we have to, again, readjust, calibrate, or if necessary, get, get rid of some of these constructs. And the, the third problem in our, uh, that we face in achieving peaceful plural societies is ignorance of the past and carrying the problems of the, um, and the wars of the past to today. None, um, so we know that we have, it, as Ibrahim Cullen today vastly explained, we are sitting on a treasure. We have a very rich tradition. So I sincerely believe people who do not know their past cannot establish a peaceful and stable future. However, I'm not talking about anachronistic and almost like retrospective reading of the past in today's norms. What we really need to con do is contextualize the past and read it in its own dynamics. We do two mistakes when we read the past. One of them is creating constants and absolutes from the past, and second is carrying over the problems and enmities of the past to today. 
So when we read our tradition and when we learn our tradition, we get this word, uh, we do get the sense of revival. However, our magic word is not revival. Even the biggest scholars of our history, Ghazali, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Sina, they wrote their work within the context and so sociology of their own time. So taking ilm, sciences as absolute, and trying to achieve revival is misleading. There will be part of their work that is rendered irrelevant or even problematic for our times. The key word is rebuild under their guidance. You learn and reapply knowledge uh, that they shared, but do not take them as absolute truth. The sense of re a revival created another problem. For example, we talked in the morning again, Orientalism, and we created Occidentalism, as if the sciences of the West, as if we have everything in our past and we don't need anything from the West. And that Occidentalism is also despi that's despising of others is also another problem, and that's not helpful. And the carrying over the enmities and the problems of the past to today. For example, I, I want to run this through a quick example. For example, the Kurdish issue. Recently, we have had this referendum, and we have been talking about it. And I ran into one scholar. He said, you don't understand. It's a thousand-year-old struggle. I was like, yes, I don't understand. How that struggle can be thousand-year-old? And how could anyone have borne it? Is it possible? Was there actually a nation state that's based on ethnic lines a thousand years ago? Because there was no Kurdish ethnic state a thousand years ago, that means it's still a 1,000-year-old struggle? And why? Why burden the people of today with the mistakes that every, almost all nations made in the 19th century? Because you see it as a historic moment. So all these overblown commemorations, memorials, remembrance days, all this anachronistic and retrospective reading of the past is creating problems, recurring burdens of the past to today. I want to finish with the last point I have is othering finding others in our societies. When there's one verse that I really like, which is the Hujrat 13. Oh, mankind, indeed we created you from a male and a female, and we made you into peoples and tribes that you may get to know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you near Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is all knower, all aware. So, Giving, you know, trying to exercise what I preached, I want to use Ibn Sina very quickly in this context. Ibn Sina ex explains existence in three terms. He says there is the absolute, the daruri, and he says there is mumkin daruri, the necessary possible create existence, and there is mumkin, there is a possible existence. Hum human beings go into the mumkin, the only absolute, but in his, uh, in his way, the only daruri that everything depends on is God. And human beings, in this context, goes into the mumkin existence, which is conditional, the possible, the changing. So if we are, in our creation, part of the possible mumkin, that also means we exist in different states at a time. How can ever any sociological con construct that we have made can be constant, absolute, and rigid? In, in this way, uh, we need to reapproach our societies and reduce that rigidity and realize everything is a social, sociological construct, and as sociologies change, we need to change. My final point comes, as we always talk about different minorities, groups, religions, but one of the biggest troubles I find in all societies that is for, in, the, in the face of pluralism is sexism. In the ayah, it said, we created you from, you from, you from a male and a female. Um, so I think one of the biggest troubles of our region is also built on sexism. I, um, so my example for this is we just pa passed Eid al -Adha. We just passed Hajj recently. And anyone who has done Hajj or Umrah, the pilgrimage, what is the most the ritual that you keep doing? The sigh. The sigh is what Hajar, Hagar, Abraham's black slave wife has done to find food and water for her dying baby. She kept going between two mountains, Safa and Narwa, seven times. And since Abraham, since Ibrahim all, and today all the Muslims do this, repeat her actions to complete their their obligatory rituals. So what is Islam? Islam is making 
all the people repeat to understand the troubles of a black slave mother. So Islam is a religion that surpasses race, class, and gender, and we should all follow. Thank you.